Hello, good afternoon. We're going to get it started. Everybody ready? Okay. So my name is Maria Alcaire. I am uh, from the University of Miami, and it is my pleasure to co-chair uh, this uh, session with Kate Powers from Harvard. And we are really, really excited about what's coming in terms of us leading this wonderful working group. It's been really amazing to have a day and a half of just thinking and talking about HIV and women. No answering emails, not doing Zooms, not talking about what's going on in our daily lives and just talking about HIV and women. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I haven't had that for a very long time. So I'm just going to walk through, a, you know, we, we started talking about reproductive health and HIV from policy to practice. That was really, really wonderful. Uh, we heard about breastfeeding, and we really had wonderful talks. And we moved to talk about antiretroviral therapy and metabolism and sex and gender differences. And I, I, I truly learned a lot in that session, too. Uh, and it was really amazing presentation for both uh, seniors and established investigators as well as uh, early stage investigators. And then um, this morning we talked about aging and HIV across the gender spectrum. So really a lot of, a lot of amazing topics. And now this is the last session of uh, this wonderful symposium. Um, it is about an HIV and women research priorities and road up. Wrap, wrap up, what a better way to finish the symposium. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce our speakers today uh, from the NIH HIV AIDS in Women Research Priorities and Listening Session. Uh, Elizabeth Barr, PhD. She's a program officer at the NIH Office of Research in Women's Health. Dr. Barr is a program officer um, and coordinates the Office of Women and AIDS and HIV research, efforts to advance intersectional health research and gender as a social and structural variable. She manages the ORWH Interprofessional Educational Program and leads efforts to advance HIV research for women. Her background is in gender studies, community-led HIV research, and reproductive justice. Dr. Barr completed her PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in rhetoric, politics, and culture and her MS, Tonsil University in Women's Health and Gender Studies. Prior to joining ORWH in 2019, Dr. Barr served on the faculties at Towson University and the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and led interdisciplinary cross-sector projects to increase women's engagement in HIV research. What a better speaker we could have for this closure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Coretta's actually going to give the first part. Oh, so, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let me introduce Coretta Sorry. then. That's okay. Um, Coretta Bird is a health science policy analyst at NIH Office of AIDS Research, and she leads several cross cutting. Uh, initiatives both within NIH ORA and between the NIH institutes and centers. Uh, she has clinical nursing experience in caring for persons with infectious diseases, chronic diseases, as well as um, acute conditions. And importantly, she has nearly two decades of experience leading and developing uh, public health policy and programming. Um, her research interests are in disease prevention, child health, women's health, health disparities, and infectious and chronic diseases. And she actually has a master's in health systems management from George Mason University. Her nursing bachelor's is from Georgetown. She has a marketing bachelor's from Alabama, University of Alabama, and she is currently working on her PhD at uh, Loma Linda University, so quite educationally accomplished. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, can you all hear me? Okay, wonderful, let's see here. Let's get started. Okay, let me just, I'm a little bit on the tall side, so I'll pull that up for, okay. So um, as I get started, good afternoon, everyone. I am Coretta Bird, and I am here on behalf of the NIH OAR. 
I will co-present with my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Barr uh, from ORWH. Uh, today, we will share more about NIH's priorities on HIV in women and what we are doing towards those priorities. And um, we will follow with a listening session afterwards. So it is important to provide context about women's health and HIV research at NIH. This timeline illustrates milestones in the authorization and organization of the offices within NIH, the NIH community, and the establishment of key policies for inclusion of women in clinical research and incorporation of sex as a biological variable. Establishment of the HIV and Women's Signature Program is a collaboration between offices across NIH that are responsive to congressional, oops, sorry, that are respond, give me one second, that are responsive to uh, congressional and White House initiatives, uh, calling for increased investment in research for women's health. The Signature Program seeks to establish I'm sorry, seeks to ensure women's health considerations are addressed by the NIH research program. As HIV crosses nearly every area of medicine and scientific investigation, the NIH response requires a multi-institute, multidisciplinary coordinated agenda, which is mandated by the legislation that established NIH OER priorities or authorities. The NIH Strategic Plan for HIV, also known as the HIV Plan, is a blueprint that guides the NIH OER in fulfilling its mission and achieving the vision of the NIH HIV AIDS research agenda, which are to advance research to end the HIV pan pandemic and improve health outcomes for people with HIV. To ensure that NIH HIV AIDS research Funding is directed at the highest priority research areas and facilities and facilitates maximal return on the investment. And notably, the plan also supports the National HIV AIDS Strategy, updated by the White House Office of National AIDS Policy just over a year ago, and it was released on World AIDS Day, December 2021. Together, these complementary frameworks guide biomedical, behavioral, and social sciences clinical and applied research, and training priorities of the NIH scientific agenda. So in terms of our strategic goals, the current strategic plan is OER's first five-year plan and covers goals and objectives through 2025. It is designed to be broad and comprehensive to support the entire spectrum of health research and informs many other activities of the office through four strategic goals, which are also known in this slide specifically. One is to advance rigorous and innovative research to end the HIV pandemic and improve the health of people with at risk for or affected by HIV across their lifespan. The second goal, to ensure the NIH HIV research program remains flexible and responsive to emerging scientific opportunities and discoveries. The third goal, to promote dissemination and implementation of research discoveries for public health impact across agencies, departments, and stakeholders within the US government and globally. And the last goal, to build human resource and infrastructure capacity to enhance the sustainability of HI research discovery and the implementation of those findings by a diverse and multidisciplinary workforce. A new framework is being prepared for the fiscal year 2026 through 2030. Um, so stay tuned for that in 2024 uh, for opportunities for the public to weigh in on that new strategic plan. Uh, an important goal of the NIH signature, pro the, uh, the signature program is to innovate programmatic mechanisms and HIV NIH-wide collaboration to ensure women's health considerations are an integrated into the strategic plan and priorities for across NIH. The current priorities were established back in 2016 when the NIH OER worked with the NIH director to develop them in collaboration with the 
institutes and offices. They were later renewed and extended for another five years, and that's where we have the 2021 through 2025 plan. Uh, these um, uh, research areas reduce the incidence of HIV, including supporting the development of safe and effective vaccines, microbicides, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, develop next generation therapies for HIV with improved safety and ease of use, conduct research toward an HIV cure, address HIV-associated comorbidities, co-infections, and complications through research design to decrease and or manage these conditions. And lastly, to advance cross-cutting areas of research in basic sciences, behavioral and social sciences, epidemiology, implementation science, information dissemination, and research training. Okay, so the HIV and Women's um, Health Dashboard within the Data Hub tool um, is um, OAR developed this to integrate, um, to in interrogate current investment and important topics related to women's health within the NIH HIV research portfolio. It's one component of a larger comprehensive effort and OAR is making this tool available to the entire NIH research community and public to be transparent. The HIV and Women's Health Topical Portfolio Analysis allows for exploration of recent NIH awards for HIV and Women's Health Research. The Data Hub also allows for HIV and Women's Health Research Portfolio to be visualized, and it's also a very interactive tool. In terms of funding, HIV um, and Women funding is roughly 500 million per year. This has been consistent over the past five years, and since I've been at this conference, we've just completed our FY23 funding analysis, and it looks very similar to FY22 in terms of funding. And, and this simply shows um, the breakdown of how the investment is distributed throughout the priorities, as illustrated in the pie chart, and um, it is consistent with a larger HIV research portfolio across NIH. So in terms, although over half of all people with HIV are women, and despite NIH policies of inclusion and sex as a biological variable, understand, understanding HIV in women is very limited. Women and people of trans experience with and affected by HIV are underrepresented across the NIH research continuum, including both in the biomedical and behavioral social sciences. This severely limits understanding of the pathogenesis of infection and comorbid infections and diseases. For the biological considerations, the WHO estimated that 1.2% of maternal deaths are HIV related worldwide, and because of comorbidities, pregnancy in people with HIV is linked to two to, ten, uh, time, ten, two to tenfold increased risk of death. Women with HIV have higher rates of non-AIDS comorbidities than men, and much remains unknown about sex differences when it comes to comorbid diseases. Women with HIV are aging, and aging women are at risk, remain at risk for HIV. CDC analyses report that HIV is on the rise in women over 55 years in the U.S., and it highlights a fundamental gap in understanding of effective prevention and considerations across the lifespan, including perimenopause and menopause. For the social and structural considerations, violence and trauma are intimately connected to HIV and women. Among women living with HIV, trauma and violence are associated with lower adherence to HIV drug regimens and poor health outcomes. Structural factors that make women and girls and people of trans experience particularly vulnerable to HIV include exclusion from economic opportunities, lack of access to secondary school, and intimate partner and gender-based violence. Women living with HIV and people of trans experience are more likely than their male counterparts and the general population to experience depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress symptoms. Women and girls that experience physical or sexual intimate 
partner violence are one and a half times more likely to acquire HIV. These traumas are exacerbated by stigma, discrimination, and bias experienced in healthcare settings and in women's home communities. Simply stated, women face unique challenges regarding HIV and AIDS, and the HIV research agenda for women should be tailored appropriately. Within these priorities, these areas require attention and funding for specifically for women. For example, there is a high global burden of HIV in women among women and young girls. Um, in 2022, 40%, 46% of all, of all new HIV infections were among women and girls. Aging, as I mentioned, there are unique age-related women's health needs in the context of chronic HIV infection, comorbidities, and multimorbidity. There are specific considerations as women with HIV have a higher burden of cardiovascular, bone, renal, and neurocognitive disease when compared with HIV-negative women. And lastly, cure, there is a lack of sex and gender diversity in basic and clinical research cure. And so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Barr. Thanks so much, Coretta, and thanks um, to the organizers. This has been really just such a fabulous two days, um, and I'm feeling very energized. I hope you're also feeling energized because we are about to ask you to tell us some things. Um, and so I, I just want to contextualize, uh, as Coretta was talking about, the signature program that has been established earlier this year. Both the OAR and the ORWH are coordinating offices within the office of the director. And so we are really just leaning into that role and um, seizing the energy that is coming from many directions um, to move this program forward and with the objectives of promoting health and well-being for all women, including cisgender and transgender women, trans men, and gender diverse individuals who are living with or impacted by HIV. And then we also want to support career development for women in HIV research. That's a critical part of this program. Where do I click? Okay, so we do that through collaboration and also sharing information in the spirit of transparency um, and accountability. And with all of the information that we gather from external engagements through some portfolio analysis, we will um, formulate strategic priorities and opportunities. And so to talk a bit about how we've done this, um, Coretta presented the NIH funding analysis where we took a look at the NIH portfolio. So we know that approximately 11% of all NIH money goes to women's health research. And then if you remember on Coretta's slide, there's only about um, 500 million in FY22 that went to the intersection of women's health and HIV. And so we, we see that. Um, we've also looked at, a state of the, at the state of the science, so we've been working with the NIH library to engage in a series of literature reviews. Um, thank you all for your important work that we are reviewing um, to identify what is known and where are sort of promising next steps in the field of HIV and women um, across the research continuum could be identified. We're also doing our best in this um, hybrid world to be engaged as much as possible physically, virtually, um, in person, via email with the many diverse stakeholders that are affected by NIH decisions around HIV research. And we've established a coordinating, a joint working group of the OAR and ORWH coordinating committees. So these coordinating committees are internal bodies that have representatives with scientific expertise from each of the 27 institutes and centers. And uh, so we've pulled experts from the HIV coordinating committee and the Women's Health Coordinating Committee to really uh, break down some of the silos that um, frustrate you and frustrate us. So we are uh, thankful to our coordinating committee working group members who are here today. And through these inputs, we um, are really excited about identifying opportunities for research around HIV and women. I just briefly want to summarize some of our recent external engagements. So the symposium, or the collaboration was formally launched at last year's, 
this year's international workshop on HIV and women, um, which featured a number of emerging and established investigators, including uh, Dr. Collins, who is here today, um, presenting their important work uh, across the research continuum. And we also had a listening session at this year's USCAJ. Coming up next year, the OAR is sponsoring two workshops, um, shown here, and there's more information with the QR code. One in Nairobi, Kenya, which is the inaugural African workshop on HIV and women, and that will be hybrid. The second is the 14th international workshop on HIV and women, which will be in Washington, DC. In addition to those, we are really thrilled, um, this is like a bucket list of mine, to um, be convening this scientific workshop next spring that will be two days, entirely virtual, uh, March 21st through 22nd. We have uh, really an all-star lineup of speakers covering um, as many important topics as we could cram into an agenda. Uh, and so the entire event will be video cast and made available um, to the public. And you know what's been really important with this workshop is that we uh, want this to be a community-centered knowledge exchange. And so we've involved community members in the planning committee. We are inviting, I think Gretchen mentioned earlier, we're inviting community members to present. And we really um, want to build those lines of communication. As was also mentioned, we want you to formally tell us through this request for information. I heard in so many presentations today and yesterday gaps that have been identified and it would be tremendous if you could um, put those gaps into this request for information <laughs> so that we have them recorded in that way. Um, we really want to have input from people with lived experience, including the lived experience of being a researcher in the field of HIV and women, um, so that we can identify gaps and priorities which will inform our future efforts. And this RFI is open through the end of this year, as you've heard many times, and we'll hear again. And then finally, uh, I just want to call attention to this really fabulous web page that the OAR has built, uh, which is intended to be a central resource for um, the community, including the research community. So this is updated regularly with events. There's a place on the website where you can click to be taken to the NIH guide for grants and funding to a sort of living search of funding opportunities related to HIV. And so you will see on that list the Syndemics RFA that Peter mentioned earlier today, which is from NIDDK, NHLBI, and ORWH is signed on, <clears throat> as well as the understudied, underrepresented, and underreported administrative supplement I mentioned, and I think 1,600 other <laughs> funding <laughs> announcements. So, you know, we really encourage you to um, make yourselves um, familiar with that website as a way to stay in touch, and there's a place there where you can sign up to receive updates. Um, you know, we recognize that the NIH can be a um, somewhat of a black box and are um, committed to doing our part to take the lid off. I don't know what the metaphor would be. Um, and so, so I am sure that many of you have questions, um, maybe, but we have two questions that we would really like to hear from you the answers to. And I will um, show you both questions, and then if the, um, session, if the panel leaders for this session will entertain us, we could maybe split the time between the two questions. Um, and you are welcome, if you don't feel uh, comfortable talking, to send your thoughts via email. Uh, but the two questions, the first relates to promoting health and well-being for all women with or impacted by HIV. So we are interested to know from your perspective what are major barriers to research on women and HIV, and then really critically, what can we do? What are some immediate and actionable next steps that we could take to address those, those barriers? So we hear and we recognize there are problems, but do you have some solutions that you would like to share with us? Um, and then to our second goal with our signature program of supporting career development for women in HIV research, we're very curious to hear from your experience what um, federal or funder or institution-supported programs have been effective 
at recruiting and supporting and elevating women in HIV research careers. So are there programs that have been really effective in your experience that NIH should be aware of or should continue doing or should go connect with those people and hear how they did it? Um, so we would really love to know if you're able to share that information with us. And again, you can um, send it to this email, women and HIV at od.nih.gov, or you can just talk to us afterwards. Um, but I think we have about 20 minutes left in our session, and so um, I'm gonna move to the table so I can write, and I would invite you to come to the microphones and tell us what we can do. Hi, I'm Lisa Babel from Mass General Harvard. I don't have all the answers, obviously, but I do have a comment slash question, which is really about agenda setting and priority setting and thinking about how the vast majority of women with HIV live outside of the United States and thinking how their needs and the local problems that people see on the ground are sort of incorporated into the priority setting at the NIH. And for the second part of this question about promoting research on women and HIV, I feel like a lot of the people who I know have been very successful are people that uh, we've worked on partnership to train in their local setting to sort of see and address the problems in their local setting. So thinking about how we could sort of expand those training programs like the D43s and the other ways, but also individual mentorship like one-on-one -on -one for those of us who aren't part of those programs but are trying also to help sort of raise the next generation of researchers, especially in resource limited settings or settings outside of the United States. Thank you so much for that. Hello, um, my name is Megan Lochran. I'm a study coordinator at UC San Diego. So just a couple like real world on the ground issues we deal with every day, childcare, transportation, cell phones, and peer navigators. So um, one thing, we're a border region, so our situation's maybe a little different, but we struggle with um, really having a peer support in a cultural, competent manner. So one example is we have a lot of Haitian immigrants who have moved to San Diego. We don't have any Haitian Creole interpreters. Um, the ones we do are in their community, and so there's a big fear of discrimination, um, inadvertent disclosure, things like that. But if we were able to hire someone from the community to be on our team in our office, it would go a long way to bringing those very, very underserved populations into studies. So, you know, for us, we try and build it into our grant requests as much as we can. But if it was more of a standard practice to include transportation, childcare, cell phones, and some of that peer support in the standard funding packages, that would make the biggest difference in our day-to-day -day lives. So, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for doing this session, I'm Renee Hefron. Uh, a couple of things that have come up recently that are pretty tangible. So the K-24 Mid-Career Mentoring Award is only open to U.S. citizens. And I have a number of tremendous colleagues uh, who have built their, who do tremendous work in Kenya and Uganda and South Africa who would be brilliant to have K-24. So that's something that, I don't know how easy it is, but it seems like a small thing, but would be wonderful so that they can be supported to train people up who will um, succeed them in their, at their research sites. And then in a similar vein, the um, requirements of the of other Ks, except for the K99, to be a US citizen is really a barrier to a lot of the trainees that we have who are at US institutions and intend to stay at US institutions but are not citizens. So those are just a couple of tangible things to bring up. Thank you so much. Hey, um, I have a couple of things, and they, and I know you have less control over this, but some of them go back to study section review, and we get a lot of pushback on why just women. 
And I'm sure all of us have examples of, you know, what the R34 I presented on, Maria can speak to this, we try to figure out how to address it. Mult, like almost, I think two of the three reviewers were like, why aren't men included? And so this idea that somehow just looking at women isn't enough. And I don't know if there are ways to set aside funding that, I mean, it's the way you're doing, I'm saying this is only for women. We, ident you know, we define that broadly. Um, the other piece is a lot of the work I do is looking at state level policies and it's actually quite hard to do that around HIV because we need large scale data sets. So for example, I do this on substance use with the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. So we're looking at samples that are, you know, 40 to 60,000 a year. If you're looking at, if you're also including young people and we don't have that clinical outcome data. And when you get to study section, you get dinged because, oh, behavioral outcomes aren't good enough. And some of the only way to get that data are through the CDC, and I have tried off and on for years, and so we really, and I've talked to people at NIMH about this, program officers, and they say, look, we want more data on the policy impacts of HIV outcomes, but we don't actually have the data sets to do that. And so I think thinking if there are ways to start really tracking that on a national level with enough of a sample size to really get at some of the intersectional policy impacts. Thank you so much. You all are tremendously efficient, I think, on the, the first question. So I might um, move us to this optimistic note of the second question, because you're going to tell us about your great training experiences that we can try to replicate. Um, okay, which would be, in your experience, what uh, federal funder or institution supported programs have effectively recruited, supported, and elevated you in your research careers? Oh dear. This is a group of women, and many are very successful researchers, so I'm sure you have stories to share. Did I do mine? <laughs> Hi, my name is Natasha Ludwig Barron. Um, I'm actually based here as a postdoc at UCSF. Um, I know I wouldn't be here without the diversity supplement mechanism uh, for my PhD program, but it is largely um, unadvertised. Um, in fact, a lot of the um, a lot of the the R01 researchers that are out there don't know about the mechanism, or they're scared to support. Um, so I think there needs to be infrastructure to actually train um, the the investigators that are out there on how to work with um, minoritized groups. Um, that could be tremendously helpful. Um, I was very fortunate to have someone who had already applied for the mechanism through through other, you know. Um, th throughout their career, so um, I was really fortunate in that regard. And just, you know, right now in my career, I think there is a huge drop-off when it comes to the postdoc phase, going back to your first question, and that, you know, our, our salary is just not attainable, you know, if you're living in any major U.S. city. Um, I've now been in my postdoc now for a third year, um, and and my, my situation's a little bit different, but within my three years, I've seen one African-American and one Latina fall out of the postdoc because it's just, the salary support is just not there. And even though I think a lot of the institutions are moving towards un unions and, and helping us bring in more salary, it's still, it's still a big struggle. Thanks so much. Hi. Um, in terms of what supported, what, two things that I think were really pivotal for my career, and I'm not pandering because I'm at UCSF, but the CAPS Visiting Professor Program um, was the only place in my career where I had like hands on, this is how you write an NIH grant, line edit, education around grant writing. Um, and it made a huge difference in my success in grant writing. Um, and then the internal K um, award, a KL, 12 or KL2, whatever I had, I don't even remember the name of it now, but it was an institutional K because I was repeatedly unsuccessful with the reviewers for a K at the larger level, like a K01, and the institutional one was the only way that I had the protected support to have time to write a grant. 
And then this is not a success, but just a request that a lot of people are talking about the K cliff. So once you get a K, it covers 75% of your salary, and then you're like, yay, you get an R, and then it covers 20% of your salary, and then your employer's like, so, <laughs> where are you gonna get that other 80%? So some sort of mechanism to support people as they move from a K to a R would be helpful. Thank you. Hi, me again. Um, so I'll say that I really benefited from the Fogarty program, which I think was really instrumental uh, twice <laughs> as a med student and as a fellow. So for people interested in international work, that was really instrumental. I also really benefit from the CIFAR Development Award, so both as a mentor who have mentees who have received it and as a recipient that has made a huge difference for me, and our CIFAR was able to increase the amount of the award a bit, which also made a big difference because it previously had been 50 or 60,000, and to increase it a little bit to help um, with salary and some project funding was really instrumental for me. And then I will say personally, in mentorship, I've really benefited from those K24 awards. I've had two mentors who've had them, and I think that really helped protect their time to mentor me through my career. And for our trainees who are training uh, overseas, they really benefit from those D43 and other sort of structured training programs and internally from the T32 grants. And I would love to see us be able to expand our T32s to focus on women's specific issues. We have T32s focused on HIV, like there's a pathogenesis one, there's an epi one. We recently have one that's more focused on sort of global T32, but I think trying to have more T programs or like widespread programs that could focus on women's health, uh, sort of intersectional or across the board would be really helpful. Thank you so much. Hi, Judy Auerbach wearing my UCSF hat today. Um, I have many, as some of you know. <laughs> There's another element to your question which is not so much connected directly to the NIH grant getting academic career trajectory. And it's sort of on parallel to the earlier person who spoke about women in community needing childcare and transportation. Women in academic and research careers outside of academia need a whole lot of just moral and, and social support. So I don't know of any kind of program that I've ever heard of at NIH, but I think thinking about other professional societies, for example, I belong <clears throat> to something called Sociologists for Women in Society, which is a long-standing feminist sociology organization that has very active peer mentoring programs across a lot of different dimensions, topical, age, race, whatever. So I think, and, and the Association of Women in Science may have something, so I think APHA may have something, APA, whatever. So looking at some of the professional societies and maybe thinking about what are some mechanisms that NIH could partner and or support that address the just sort of lives of women who are attempting to be researchers um, and are not financially and professionally interested in, in the sense of being that person's boss or, you know, somebody who's going to be judging them. Thanks so much for that. We may have deflected the hot seat for um, as long as we can, so I, I think that we are to answer some questions from you all that are unrelated. <laughs> if you have some, we're happy to answer any questions we can. Hello. Um, this isn't, maybe this is beyond what you might be able to answer, um, but uh, we've had the same EHE jurisdictions for quite some time now, and there was the idea that um, maybe by 2025, 2026, we might see some, perhaps like a second wave of jurisdictions or some to get added or something along those lines given that NIH uh, also has some EHE supplements and whatnot, I was wondering if you all knew anything about whether or not we'll sort of be continuing with these or um, whether or not any other jurisdictions will be added or anything like that. So thank you for that question, Christian. Um, I don't have the answer to, to that question right now. I certainly can get back to you on that, but um, as I understand, I. I don't first, I haven't heard anything about any new jurisdictions being added, but I'll, I'll certainly get back to you on that. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Well, can I, yeah, uh, let me get my phone and I'll get it. It's a long list. I know, I know. So we're just getting the, the notice study for the underrepresented uh, PA that went out at Lauren's request, so you can copy that down and get a grant application in <laughs> shortly. Um, but this, this is a great opportunity to ask questions or to express concerns, and we're in our final five minutes of the conference, so if you'd like to get your questions in, now would be a great time to hop up to the microphone. So the Syndemics RFA that Peter mentioned is RFA DK25001, and then the... U3, it'll take me another minute. It's NOT dash OD dash two four dash zero three two and those are one year administrative supplements direct costs are capped at 140 they can, they can be applied to almost any activity code I have one question related to those RFAs both specific to the supplements and then and then to the other that are non supplement RFAs so for the supplements I'm curious how the pay lines are set for those or how people can sort of assess their competitiveness. And then for non-supplement RFAs, uh, especially for some of us who are more junior investigators, trying to understand the pipeline. So when an RFA comes out on a specific topic, that's an area of interest for the NIH or specific institutes. My understanding is that um, there's clearly an area of interest, but they still have to meet the same pay lines as other applications to be funded. Is that correct? So just trying to get a better understanding. Sure, that's a great question. So the administrative supplements that I mentioned are reviewed programmatically, and so those would be supplements to an existing funded grant. And so um, they do not go through the, it's a different review process. And so um, I would encourage you to reach out to the contact who's listed on the on that one who can talk to you about the fit of the program, uh, but it's a slightly different review process. And then um, I don't know off the top of my head NIDDK's pay line, but I do know um, that, yeah, I w yes, it would go through the, the same sort of um, processes unless, P no, Peter's saying no, Peter can, <laughs> Peter's gonna clarify. So when a no a no fo no some funding opportunity is an RFA flavor, there's a set aside and they get a score, but they don't get percentiled, so they don't really go to the pay line. So when the funding decision is made over which ones to fund, um, the score is one piece of information. Um, the discussion that occurred leading to the score is another piece of information and there may be other programmatic interests that play into it. So, um, so, this, so it doesn't go through that pay line and you don't necessarily go in score order even when funding grants off of an RFA. So um, does that answer the question? So it's a different procedure because the, the, the pay line is you know, basically the investigator initiated grants are all reviewed as you know, as in the same big pot, and this is its own set aside, so it's very different. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we're going to be closing uh, this amazing symposium. And just um, Um, I want to say again that Kate and I are really, really excited to lead in this uh, energetic group and are looking forward to, to 
work together over the next three years. Um, I think this is relevant to your second question, Elizabeth, and it is uh, what are the institutions and what can the NIH do to support research on women as well as careers? And I think this group is a great example of that. Uh, I want to end uh, with just reminding what the mission of this uh, working group is, which is the Inter-CIFAR Collaboration in HIV Research and Women Working Group. It's a network of CIFAR investigators dedicated to promoting cutting-edge science in HIV and women research, and we have seen that over the past couple of years. Um, we do have a symposium every two years, so hoping to see you in two years three webinars per year, one which will be uh, sometime in the spring and you will get the notification and we give updates on CROI, clinical science, basic science and presentation both by senior and early stage investigators. We have a steering committee and thank you for those of you who are part of that steering committee that sets those annual goals and thematic focus of the symposium for discussion with the executive committee. Uh, we do an effort and mentor early stage investigators in developing the careers in HIV and women's health research. And uh, you can go back to your CFARs and try to get pilot awards. And that was, in my case, was uh, really uh, the way to start my, my career in addition to a diversity supplement. Um, and. Uh, I think that's it. I will really, really thank you to having all of you here and looking forward to, to work together. Oh, one more announcement. There will be a website, a, a new website starting in January since we are transitioning the leadership of the working group. So we will share that with your CFARs and just uh, once that's announced, you'll be able to, you won't have to re-register to be a member of the group, but just distribute among your CFARs because that will be the new uh, way of communicating with, with all of you. Um, that's it, right? Anything else? No? Well, thank you everybody. <laughs> <laughs>